And that's what I want to kind of start with. I want to open up here about just uh, in um, uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, because depending on where you're at, uh, this prayer you may, may resonate with you stronger or not. But this is a prayer, uh, I mean, this is a, this is a direction. Uh, this is direction before we get to the prayer that David's getting ready to die. He's an old man. And if you've read 1st and 2nd Samuel and you see how much David is talked about through used by God's plan instrumentally, but also how great he was and how many amazing things he did that God even said he was a man after my own heart. Yet then we see the incredible sinful period of his life as well. But God still said at the end, this was a man. He's a man after my own heart. So uh, he definitely learned the lessons from God in all different arenas. When he was a shepherd boy, when he didn't even know there was an organized movement, he just knew I'm supposed to be tending the sheep, but he believed in God because he was raised as a Jewish young boy. So he knew God was definitely real. And he wrote a lot of his Psalms when he was out there in under the stars with this, the sheep really didn't have leadership role, didn't really have a title. He wasn't even allowed to be in the army when the battles were going, he's too young. Yet he really, I think, developed an incredible personal relationship with God by himself out there all alone, but he wasn't alone. And that's what, that was the incredible realization that he came to. And then he was anointed to be the king, right? God chose him to lead the people, but then uh, God didn't allow the powers to be to allow it to happen. So he had to trust God. Like he could have questioned God so many times, like, wait a minute, you anointed me. Is this really real? Are you real? Is Samuel really a prophet? Then why is the leader of your movement not only evil, but no one's taking him out and he's trying to take me out and I got to keep running and then I'm not going to take him out because I still trust you. And he had to press with that where he even goes, I, I'm going to trust you're in control, even though when we read that, we're like, wow, even when he remember he sneaks in the cave and cut off a little bit of his robe and then didn't take his life, but then said, hey, I could have, but I, I, I respect you because I respect God. So here we are after he's learned so many things that all of us are, as men trying to walk with God, really in many ways, no different than Dave, right? We, 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 we come to faith. We understand that God sent his son. We become true disciples and we start walking, right? And we start learning and hopefully recovering and repenting and and, and getting back up and, and staying and realizing even the commands of God are not, are, are, are not like, we don't take them for granted. We more, we more like, these are blessings. These are protections. Like coming tonight, it's a protection. Yeah. And uh, because everything's coming at you. And we know greater men than us have fallen and not come back. And if we look in 1 Kings 2, we see very powerful words. He says, when, t when, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. Be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him. Keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations, as written in the law of Moses. Do, do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go and that the Lord may keep his promise to me if your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel so we see kind of emotional here if you really imagine you know, uh, if you guys have ever had somebody close to you, you will, if you haven't had someone die close to you, it's inevitable because uh, if you are loving people, especially your family and then each other, we're going to know that people are going to go. So he says here, but he loved God so much that he even took, instead of just letting himself wither away and he was an old man, he was so old that he couldn't keep warm in bed anymore. It actually says that he could not keep <laughs> No matter how many blankets on, he could not keep warm. And there's other places where, where they, uh, you know, uh, had to keep him warm. So he was really elderly. Yet he takes the time and his convictions were not weakened. Because look at this. This is a man that probably couldn't get out of bed by himself anymore. And he's saying, listen, I'm going to die. Be strong and act like a man. 
And then what is the key? Obey God. You know what? If you obey God, your life is protected. If you obey God, if you strive to just be obedient to God, and you go, there's no, I mean, don't, don't look at outside circumstances, just obey God. Everything else is going to be okay. Yes. If yes. you disobey God or to take God, don't take God as God wants you to take him as, you know, reverence and awe, you're going to actually slip and not take him and take him for granted without even meaning to, because most of the world of people who believe in God, lots of people believe in God, don't understand what a disciple is, nor do they even realize they're not revering God the way that one would if they really knew God. And we have to be reminded of that, not be, you know, we, we, he wants us to approach him like a dad, father, but he still wants us to understand he is God and we are not, but he doesn't want to have to make, push his point. We just need to know how all powerful he is, but how all loving he is, right? So that means that we should be grateful for everything and expect nothing because we've already been given something that you cannot buy and that's salvation and the love of God and one another. Um, if you look at, um, um, look at, uh, now I want to go back to a prayer that he says, uh, and it was in, um, it's in, uh, second, uh, Come on, Chris. it's in, um, sorry, it's right here. This is before he talked to David, I mean, before he talked to Solomon earlier, and he was just having one of those reflection times, which I love when God, that's in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I love when God allows us, to, allows a prayer to be written in the Bible of a man or a woman who is praying, because we know that it's our accurate heart before God. We know that he's allowing us to observe not only Jesus praying, but then when we see another flawed human being, the prayer is recorded. You know the heart is right. The priorities are right because you wouldn't want to mislead us, right? right. So if you see this, it says, um, uh, Did I say 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18? Yeah. Yes, he's sitting here, and David starts to pray. And he says, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. So he just got done talking with his, the prophet Nathan. He reported to God all the words of this entire revelation. And just, you know, he was trusting God and listening to his prophet and then he goes in and takes time. That would be, that'd be, that'd be really setting time with God. He goes in away from people and sat before the Lord. Not, he didn't see the Lord, but he sat before the Lord. That's what you're doing if you're really walking and understand you have the privilege to do that. And he says, who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you brought me this far? Do you just hear the incredible overflow of gratitude and wonder coming out of his prayer. He's, he's not saying, I deserve to do this. I'm King Dave. No, he's just like, who am I? Can't believe what you've done with me, what you've done. And he says, who, who is my family that you, that, I brought, that you brought me this far through all the good, the bad, and the ugly? He's still there. He's just in awe of God. And if this were not enough, in verse 19, in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. There is no God but you, as we have heard with our own eyes. And, and, and who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as people for himself and to make a name for himself and perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods before your people and whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people, Israel, as your very own forever. And you, Lord, 
have become their God. And, you know, this is before God opened this up to all nations and really brought Jesus down. But now because of Christ, we can absolutely say and mean the same thing Amen. because we are part of his family. Who are you? I hope you can say that. Yeah. Because if you're not able to say that, then there's something wrong with what you're prioritizing. I'm not saying you don't have problems or challenges or pains, but you got to get centered. Because when David said, I'm going to leave now, I'm getting ready to die. I know I'm going to die. Anything humanistically that he was concerned about is off the table because he can't do anything about it anyway. But if you're really honest, all you can do is pray, do the good you can do, and then you have to surrender anyway right now. You, can, you can't change stuff coming your way right now. Right. You can just be ready with God to navigate and embrace. Mm -hmm. You can't. Now, if you're obedient to God, that will give you the security. If you can trust by obeying God, the circumstances will work out if you continue to obey God inside the circumstances. When the road doesn't seem like it's going the right way or it's hurting. Obedience to God. So if you think about this, uh, I want us, you know, God knows our thoughts. Does anybody think God doesn't know our thoughts? Right? The Word of God is living and active, right? And, and last week, last Sunday, I talked about, I used that parable. You guys remember on Sunday, I talked about uh, the parable when Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus into his home and the sinful woman came in and how hard that was and how much courage that took mm -hmm. because she wasn't, it, did, it was courage, but I don't think she had to muster it up too much. I think she was just so blown away of like, who am I as this Everybody may look at me and just look at me as a, as a, as a prostitute and, and, and I get sneers and looked on and I already am full of shame and the things I'm doing because I'm trying to, uh, whatever her justification or at that point she went in there with that kind of gratitude probably going, who am I that I've now understood that you are from God and you are going to forgive me. And that's why she continued to wash his feet weeping. I think she was oblivious of everybody. I think if she was still self-focused, it would have been so insecure. But she just wasn't like getting it done quick. She was like, and, and Jesus let her do it. See, for, for anybody that wasn't God, that'd be really inappropriate. For anybody to say anybody, even for God to say, kiss my feet, that would be like, we, we go, why would God do that? He didn't tell her how to be grateful. He just expressed what... And every time he talks about a parable, he lays it down and says, for each of us, every human being ever born or ever born or ever will be born, to be able to look at the parable and go, where do I fit? And you're going to fit sometimes in the wrong part of the story, but that's if you're humble. If you're not humble, you're just going to talk yourself into just assuming you're there. But if you're honest, you're going to be able to say sometimes you're going to be like Simon the Pharisee. That's not that grateful. That took for granted God was a guest in his home and didn't even do the customary things because he thought we were just on the same. God's my buddy. Okay? We're, we're, you know, instead of like reverence. And that's why Jesus said this. But I want to show you something even I touched on briefly. But I want to touch on it more because last Wednesday, well, I mean, the two weeks ago, remember we talked about iron sharpening iron? Yes. And, you know, guys, I hope you know why I kind of wanted to remind you of that exercise. It's not to try to one-up each other or think negative about each other. It's, it's, it's to always look at each other as you're awesome. Be grateful that you get to hang out with Gary or see Gary or Chris or uh, DeAndre or any of us. Be grateful and go and don't go in like that. And, and if anything, you're going, who am I that I have one friend, not only two? Yeah. But then obviously we know there's a battle and we know that sin can destroy us. Yeah. So we also know that God designed us to be close enough to use his word, but his word's not enough because our sinful nature is too strong. We must all be walking with the living God in his word. But if we just read our word and just, and just keep our thoughts to ourselves, you're going, I, I think you put yourself in a very dangerous place. And I'm going to show you why, because if we look at, um, um, you know, in Luke, uh, God gives us a chance in the book of Luke, and he invites us to ask ourselves a question. What would I do in this situation? And what would I say in my own heart? In fact, Luke's gospel is, it is precisely because Jesus was suffering with the outcasts 
showing them compassion that those in power challenge authority. Luke was always going to the person that might be the less than or the, the unpopular or the misfit or the person that the, the, the populace would not want to have anything to do with or be embarrassed to be around it. That's kind of like the culture, right? He always went and didn't care what people thought and gave his love to, to anybody. And Luke, through the spirit, gets to write this. This is very interesting. Because uh, Simon, remember Simon the Pharisee, the religious leader, invited Jesus to dine in his home, right? Mm -hmm. Only Luke has Jesus being invited specifically to the home of a Pharisee in the book. It's still the same thing, but Luke just camps out on that out of the other Gospels. Suddenly, an uninvited, unnamed woman appears who is described simply as a sinner in the city or a sinful woman. That's all she says. That, that's not a very good topic. The sinful woman. We're, we're going to refer back to Luke, uh, uh, Luke 7, 36 in a minute. But, but I'm just re recapping the story. We read it on Sunday, if you guys, the ones of you, weren't, the ones of you who weren't asleep. I'm just kidding. None of you were asleep. It was pretty far. All right. So, um, without, so without speaking, the woman doesn't speak. You know, she came in there. She does not speak. She weeps. Wets Jesus' feet with her tears, wipes them with her hair, kisses them, and anoints them with perfumed oil, in verse 38 of Luke 7. Many commentaries point out that this anointing story could be read as preparation for Jesus' death and resurrection, as ironic coronation for the rightful king of the Jews, and that's opinion. Uh, but Jesus makes... Uh, these Jewish overtones explicit in the gospel parallels to this story. For instance, um, others taking their cue from Jesus, right? He's there doing this. And Jesus contrasts the woman's lavish act of hospitality and faithfulness with Simon's failure to demonstrate the ancient virtue of hospitality. Because if you know about that time, Simon didn't even do what someone would do for a visitor coming in the hall. Right. And that means he was self-righteous and obviously did not even see Jesus as he really was yet. But he had him in and he invited him in. So there was more than just inviting a dude in. So he already totally blew uh, and, and, and did not, wasn't faithful in, the, in a strong culture. It was like violating it. Um, and it would, and it, in those days, it would be like bring shame on your household if you didn't show hospitality. You guys ever seen the movie? Um, gosh, it's about those four Navy SEALs that go to Iraq or in the, behind the scenes. Uh, no, what was going? What? Almost were two good ones, but uh, it had uh, Mark Wahlberg in it, uh, and they go over and they, they, uh, they're trying to. Uh, get recon and they, they these little uh yeah, lone survivor you anybody see that movie lone survivor do you remember when the when the, when the uh, was it uh, was it in afghanistan afghanistan remember when they went down to that village yeah. and that one man brought him in and he wasn't part of the taliban but he was part of the culture he, he didn't know but he brought him in the taliban came in and the guy was willing to die to not give his guests away. The guests in home. Do you remember that? Yeah. That was, that's, that's an ancient culture back there in the Middle East. They still had it. That guy was willing to die for these Americans who were hated on that side. It wasn't even a military issue. It was such a strong custom that these are my guests. I took them here home. I'm not going to have shame on my house. I will die before I let these guests, these strangers, die. I mean, a lot of us Americans watch that. You go, what? But that's how strong the culture is back then. Okay, so... I want us, though, I, w I, want, I, I want to focus instead on the small detail of this story that I barely mentioned on Sunday that often goes unmentioned. The fact that Simon objects to himself. And look in verse, uh, Luke verse 39, because this is very, I mean, it's always a reminder that in, in 39 it says here, it says here, when the Pharisee, you guys with me? When the Pharisee who would invite him saw this, he said to himself. That means he didn't speak out loud. He thought, if, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. 
And then Jesus says, hey, Simon, I got something to tell you. Wouldn't that shock you if you were thinking to yourself negatively about somebody in the room and then someone looked at you and said, hey, dude, I got something to tell you. And they re they called you out in a, in, in a, in a kind way with a story. So you'd even kind of go, you'd, you'd go, did he hear what I said? Because he didn't call him out. He said, Simon, I got something to tell you. And he just made this story about exactly to, to convict Simon. But the power of this is, if you guys want to turn down, turn up the heat, if you guys are cold, somebody cold? No. Okay. No. All right. If this man were a prophet. So let's explore this a little more closely. The story of the woman anointing Jesus' feet occurs in each of the other uh, gospels, by the way. But in comparison with the other versions, only Luke makes it clear that Simon objects, objects silently to himself. Which obviously the word of God is living and active, sharp and a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. And then it says nothing is uncovered. Everything is laid bare to him whom we must give an account. So God says, try to say, listen, there's nothing hidden. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And, it's not, and, and it should be to make people fear God and be afraid before they become disciples. Once you become a disciple, if you're walking in the light, you should be comforted in his love and grace as you come forward and continue to be open and realize that's part of the reason that we need to love each other is to help each other and commend each other for being open and, and say this is a serious sin and keep, keep walking. But if you're still fearing God like that, then you're, then you're in hiding and not willing to be humble, then you have maybe... Uh, a misunderstanding who God is because you should be scared to death if you're not saved but once you're saved you should take it seriously you're in sin but if you're open because he knows everything anyway and he expects you to know this now most people would say I, I believe that but they don't live that way he expects us to live like we know he knows what we're thinking so we change it so it says it says here so then we see um, in Mark's version the onlookers we're not going to go there uh, object to the woman's actions among themselves, which implies that they spoke aloud, perhaps only amongst a few people, rather than directly to Jesus. In Matthew, the disciples openly object, it's, in, it, openly, uh, object in Matthew 26, 28. And similarly in John, Judas voices his concerns out loud. And he says, this, this could have been sold for one year wages, so he makes it obvious. But only Luke highlights Simon's unspoken thoughts and Jesus' ability to perceive them. And we find Luke's version of this scene a fulfillment of a prophecy that was pronounced over Jesus when he was an infant by Simeon. And let's look at that real quick. Let's look at Luke 2, 25. Because this is what's powerful as you start to read the Bible more and more. You see how profound it is. And not only does God know everything, he doesn't know everything to make us feel like we're being watched. And we're, 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 if we make one mistake, he's going to get us like a communist country. No, it's all love. He, he, it's not even about catching us. He's wanting us to have the heart of trust. He already knows what we're doing. It's a heart. It's always about the heart. But look at this in, in Luke 2.25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was a righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah or Savior. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations. How can we say not to go all nations? The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So, you know, sometimes you read that and you go, well, Mary, she did get pierced when Jesus got pierced. She saw it, but this was for all us too. This goes back to the word of God study. You could use this scripture and go, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword when you're trying to convict people. Because it says here that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own too. 
Because God already knows, but the question is, are you going to know in a way that you're godly sorrowful and bring it up? Or are you going to be like Simon the Pharisee and go, I'm not God, but I'm not that far off. But no, are we, we need to be the weeping woman. We've already been forgiven, but we need to be so grateful. That woman wasn't weeping in shame anymore. She was unbelievably shocked and in awe as she was white, washing her feet and pouring everything that her life can change. She can be forgiven and she can also get, not have to be shame anymore. That's why she wasn't leaving. She was overwhelmed that she could not believe that Jesus had come to save her too. That's why she said, your faith has saved you. I for, and your sins are forgiven because Jesus on earth had the, the, had the power to forgive sins, right? So, so the sword, I mean the soul. So, the, so today the world calls, you know, reflecting inside inner, internal monologue is so common in our in today's literature, and even the way when you re read novels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that we hardly even notice it, but ancient art authors rarely use this device in telling stories. When they did, it was typically a moment of crisis in the story when the hero is undergoing some intense internal conflict. In fact, there's popular authors that I have not heard of, but they're here, and I looked this up, Homer, Ovid, Virgil, I'm sure all you guys are really familiar with these authors. No, you're not. <laughs> Yeah, fam famous, famous literary authors, they often follow a three-part formula if you're reading a book. The introduction of the inner speech, taking stock of the problem, and the hero's chosen solution, which is fine to do. You should, even in your own life, you, 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 you may think, what am I going to do? You, you, you think, it's okay to in your mind, go, what am I going to do now? Like the other day, I was standing before, in my bedroom, we have a second level uh, dresser and we have our printer and pictures and frames and all stuff on it and I was just standing there and all of a sudden the thing popped off it's it's two pieces but but it fits perfectly and I didn't touch it and all of a sudden it went it fell the printer and all the things just went shattering like an avalanche and I was just standing there glasses on me and I'm just looking at it and I just stayed quiet and absorbed I've learned nowadays that anything that happens bad I just absorb I, it's a good, I maybe not be biblical but I don't say anything I just sit in it and absorb because it's not going to help to react, and I just waited until it all calmed down, and I looked at all this huge mess and glass planet printer, and I just started picking up things one at a time. But I didn't plan that. <laughs> but in my mind, I go, what am I going to do now? This is, uh, okay, is the printer working? So I took in, <laughs> and what should I do? Okay, and he cleaned it. Why did it break? The nails popped out. I had to put it in. And so, but, but Luke also intends to incorporate interior monologue into crisis situations, God's word for us. Because instead of having interior monologue, that's what most people do, even non-Christians do that. They, they continue to have conversations in their head, not because they're mentally ill, because they're, they're rerunning a last conversation, or they're thinking about what went wrong with that other person, or they keep thinking about an unresolved conflict. That doesn't help, it just makes it worse. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Because if you keep running inner dialogue about, about your inner intersection with somebody, you're going to probably pretty much get to the point where it's more their fault than yours. And it may be, but, but if it's not, you're still going to run it in back of trust. Why did he say this? What was that about? Is someone talking about it? It just gets worse and worse, way bigger than it's supposed to be. That's why Jesus says, don't let the sun go down with your inner dialogue. Get, go to them. You're not helping anybody thinking about it. It's not going to help you. So it says here, Luke tends to do this. Now, we never see Jesus thinking to himself in the Bible. We never see it. But we see a lot of other people doing it. And we do it too, because I was thinking about myself. I was like, oh my gosh. And there's nothing wrong in one sense, but think about how convicting this is, because Luke tends to use inner dialogue for characters who are not noble or heroic. In fact, they embody self-centeredness. This is the prominent theme in the ancient Jewish lit literature. What one says to oneself indicates wisdom or foolishness. But no one else knows. More commonly, the Hebrew Bible, inner speech de depicts the thoughts of the wicked. The Old Testament, the fool says in his heart, for instance, there is no God. That's in Psalm 14.1. It says, the fool says in his heart, that means he's not talking out loud. He's not going, there is no God in his heart, in his mind, in his heart. There's no, there's no God. He said, God says, you're a fool. Inner dialogue. You, I don't believe there's God. Uh, and, uh, and for instance, while, while the one turns away from God, blesses himself. Look in Deuteronomy 29, 18. 
So the, we're looking at the inner dialogue, and we're going to get to the question for you guys. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, and no one is good. People would not maybe say that out loud, and they may even think they believe in God, but they're really living that way. But if you look at De Deuteronomy 29, check this out. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord or, or God to go worship the gods of those nations. Make sure no one, no root among you that produces such bitter poison. When a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves, thinking, I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way. They bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never for, will be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will fall on them, and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for disaster according to all the curses of the covenant written in this book of law. The question I want you to look at, and the, the, the verse here that we need to focus on is verse 19. When such a person hears the words of this oath, and they invoke a blessing on themselves. Have you ever heard somebody go, you go, how you doing? And they go, I'm blessed. That's weird. Now I know why it sounds weird. Because you're not the one to say I'm blessed. You can say I'm grateful for God. But I, there's a lot of people today that are religious that are go, how you doing? I'm blessed. I always go, how do you know? <laughs> In my inner thought, I don't say it like <laughs> Why would someone go, I'm blessed? You don't get to decide if you're blessed. God blesses you. So you can say, I'm grateful. But people walk around so confident and arrogant at times that aren't even right with God. I, I know some of their lives. I'm blessed. I'm not going to argue with that, but I go, whoa, you are? Look what he says about this. That's an inner dialogue. I'm blessed. But look, look at the heart that people can have. Such a person hears the words of his oath, invoke a, blessing of, invoke a blessing on themselves, thinking, I will be safe even though I persist on going my own way. Mm -hmm. Meaning I won't obey God, I'll have a form of godliness, but uh, denying no power. I'm not a disciple, but I'm, re I'm religious. I call myself a Christian, but I refuse to submit to you, show, to God showing me I'm in false doctrine. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Wow. And they keep going their own way. That's what you think. Um, that's your opinion. No, it's the Bible's opinion. And then they keep going to church regardless of what God has pointed out in the Word. And, and, and they still think they're blessed. And they have no idea what they're heading for. Because they are looking at their food, clothing, and shelter and situation in life. That's keeping them distracted enough to think that's why I'm blessed. That's not that, that could even be the demons. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. So now let's get back to the point here. The, the point is, and I'm just going to read these really quick. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. These are other passages in wisdom and literature. Uh, in uh, Zephaniah 2, 3, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, and who do what, and who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the draw on the day of the Lord's anger. Perhaps. Wow. Talk about, talk about taking your salvation for granted. It says perhaps. Perhaps you'll be sheltered on the day of the Lord. It, it, see, if we start going around because we were baptized, and that's true, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. If you're banking on that statement, it's my fourth spiritual birthday, don't get me wrong. Don't be too happy about that. Just make sure, am I walking in the light today? Am I walking in the light five months from now? Because it doesn't hold water. Even though a miracle did happen, you have to keep with your part of the relationship with Jesus, Lord, and I will continue to repent and walk in the light. Yeah. And even we can get self-righteous because we think we went through the right doctrine and we're saved that it's just almost a stronger stamp than what our hearts need to continue to do, and that is keep our vow. And walk in the light. There's no excuse to have hidden sin and stay hidden in sin. It's, it's understandable, but it's unacceptable. And it's only unacceptable because he's given you every way out. Forgiveness, but, you, but the ones that get distant and don't get open with one another, now you're in trouble because you're not obeying that part of seeking first the kingdom and being devoted to one another and really giving your heart quickly to each other. Not just because you're friends, because you're brothers. And brothers love each other even if you have nothing in common. And if you don't do that, you're going to get in trouble because you're going to get in sin and you're not going to get open and you don't, no one's going to crowbar you open. So you just miss that one. So do you know people 
If you look in, Ze uh, in, uh, in, in the Ze Zephaniah 3, verse 2, you don't have to look there, but you can write it down if you know where it is. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. And Zephaniah is talking about Israel, talking about all the people of God. That's their attitudes. Obeying no one, accepts no correction, does not trust in the Lord, even though they think they're doing all those things. Do you know people who refuse to listen when someone disagrees with their opinions? When someone gives an opinion, do you know people that refuse to listen? I can tell you, you can look on the TV every day. If someone says, I'm Democrat or Republican, you can see different people that will shut down. I'm not even being your friend. I don't even comprehend that. I cannot believe that. It doesn't even matter who you are for. How could you actually get so angry at a human being for disagreeing with you? How could you take it so personal that you don't like a person because they believe some other way? Even if they don't believe in God. How could you? We don't, we're, we're not the judge. We're here going, hey. I get it. It's probably hard. You're looking up there going, where are you? I don't see nothing. I was like that for a while, but I'm here if you want, but I'll still be your friend. Mm -hmm. I can't change that, right? Yeah. The root problem with Simon in that room when he thought to himself was pride. Mm. Inflated self-esteem. Sometimes Sunday is like the fashion show in some churches. And there's nothing wrong with dressing sharp. And I do got to give the ribbon to Fred DeGene. He dresses sharp all the time anyway. But last Sunday, I don't know if you know, he had that suit on. And he had that, what do they call that, the scarf? Dude, you were dapper. And, and Nick was dapper. A lot of you guys coming dapper. You're actually getting me convinced that maybe I start wearing a tie. Because I just, I don't know. I never was, just, I don't know what happened to me. I just, you know, they let me out of prison at 25 and I just wasn't used to wearing a tie. And then I became a minister. I'm just kidding. But, but you guys are dapper. But you can never think, like church isn't, you know, it's not about the outside, right? We need to try to give our best for God on Sunday. So don't get me wrong. When people come, they want to see me make an effort. But God's people had become so proud that they would not hear or accept God's correction. You can say, wait a minute, bro. If I'm reading the Bible, I'm saying, no, no. But do you accept God's correction from a human being talking to you about God's correction? That's, God looks at it the same way. Do you find it difficult to listen to the spiritual counsel of others or God's words from the Bible? Don't let your pride make you unable or unwilling to let God work in your life. Here's some inner dialogue. I'm just going to read this quick. I said to myself, look, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much wisdom and knowledge. That's Ecclesiastes. He's like, look what I've done. Ecclesiastes 2.1. I said to myself, inner dialogue, come now, I will test you with the, with the pleasure to find out what is good. And then in Luke, back to 7.36, we see Simon faces a choice. He is deciding between two opposing views of Jesus' identity. That's what Jesus does to us. He's got in that parable Simon's inner thoughts that we get to hear because Jesus let us hear them. But no one in that room at that time heard him. No one outside that room. No, it was recorded for us, but everybody in that room had no idea what Simon was thinking except Jesus. And then the word was allowed right out. So we're in on this inner secret that God knew because he's trying to help us go, who are you? And he says here, Either Jesus, these are two opposing, either Jesus is a prophet or he isn't. Deciding between two opposing views. The question itself demonstrates that Simon lacks love, hospitality, and true discernment. Further, he clearly does not want to dialogue with Jesus. He simply thinks to himself. He was Jesus' guest. He could have been real. Why wasn't he real with Jesus? They, if, if, they, if you can't say it out loud, why, why, then it must be a problem. They should have said, Jesus, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, the sinner got in. I don't know how they got in. We're, we don't dine with sinners. Please escort the sinner out. When Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you, he may be implicitly contrasting his own willingness to dialogue with Simon's failure to do so. So sometimes with us, we don't speak when we're not doing well, but we're thinking a lot. And then someone goes to, then, then one of us need to go there and start interacting with your inner dialogue and say, what's going on? Because you're already running it. You know you're doing wrong. You're doing bad, but you're not saying it to anybody. So do you, do you engage 
with someone that you know may have an inner dialogue not, that needs help to get open. Yeah. Jesus' response proves exactly what Simon is questioning. He does, in fact, know the character not only of the one who is touching him, which is the woman washing his feet, but also of the one who is judging him suspiciously. And see, doubt or lack of trust is a major sin. Love always trusts. The minute you, you, you can't give trust or you have any kind of second thoughts about a brother or sister in the church, you're in sin. Whether they're wrong or not, you're in sin because you're not giving open dialogue. You're innerly going, you're, you're, you're thinking suspiciously. And that is the vision and that is Satan. Internal, internal monologue has a significant function for an audience. Giving voice to a character's thoughts can uniquely engage readers or hearers if you're writing a movie or a play or, or a book by inviting them to imagine their own personal reactions in similar situations. For instance, if you're reading a really good book and it's a story, you'll be in the character and the character will be in his mind. You'll be in the character's mind with him thinking that way. But that's not why God does it in the Bible. God does it in the Bible because Luke invites us through the Spirit to ask this question. What would I do in this situation? What would I say in my own heart? That's what, he, that's what the Bible says to us. So when the Bible presents something, he thought to himself, you should not look outside and go, oh, that guy's out there. Go, what would you think to yourself? That's what God's wanting to know right now. How do you react? And be honest. And what would your own heart say? Are you Simon? Or are you more like the woman on her knees weeping in gratitude toward the Savior of the world? I say I've been both. But I learned to be honest in my quiet times. And the more humble you are, that means the more honest you are, where you can be honest and grace is there. And the only way you can have God help you is if you're honest. And it starts there. Anybody who acts like they're just kind of on autopilot as they've been a Christian. There's nothing else really to work on. That's a problem. I, I can share with you guys stuff I'm always trying to work and grow on. But if we just start, like we just get to a certain level, we just stop giving our heart and changing, then there's a problem. You're becoming like a Pharisee because you just don't see the magnitude of your sin. Not to feel bad, but you should be like becoming the leader of the world for Christ, if that's what he wants. You don't just kind of go, that's my role, and assume, no, God decides what your role is. In addition, Jesus' response to Simon might serve as a useful prompt for us to think careful about how we can transform our, our internal monologue. So uh, psychologists refer to it self-talk today. There's nothing wrong with thinking through, like, what am I going to do now? What should I do? Where should I go to AutoZone and get advice? Or should I take that part off? Or should I call Vons over here and say, what would you do? If it's something fixed, that's fine. But spiritually speaking, you got to go... Are you just talking and thinking spiritually, or are you learning to turn that into prayer? And look at, look at as we come from land, look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Because guys, how many times, you may not go, I thought to myself, but you do think to yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And do you remember the story of the man who built bigger barns? When you read that, if you ever look at that way, he goes, doesn't even really say he did anything wrong. Actually, if he was a man today in modern world, he could probably write a lot of books that would be helpful to help us be successful. He'd probably have great discipline, great character. He made wise decisions. He'd be like rich man, poor man, or the art of the deal. He'd be a guy that wrote a book that's showing you how to build a life of wealth. And there's nothing wrong with that as far as being successful, driven. But there's no God involved in any of his speech. It's, he, all he says is, I thought to myself, I said to myself, what will I do? Oh, this is what I'll do. It's all about his inner dialogue. Just what am I going to do now? I got more money. I'll build this. What am I going to do? No advice from anybody and no God. And then God goes, you're a fool. Your life's being demanded from you. And all this rich stuff, all these things you build, you get none of it. And you were not rich toward me one bit. And that's what's wrong with inner dialogue because it usually focuses on self. And look in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, or pray unceasingly. That's one verse. There's two words in that verse, 17. Pray continually. I give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So, to pray continually 
would be to take your inner dialogue and now go one step further and go, God, what do you think? God, help me with this. What should I do? Then you may get advice and say, what do you, I'm thinking about this. And you always try to turn anything into making sure, is this the will of you? And if I'm doing it, am I doing it with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? We think a lot to ourselves, and when you haven't been doing well spiritually, tell me if you haven't done that, where you're not really open, and just you, the devil, and God know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's why he created us to be in each other's lives, not because we have to. The word discipling is so foreign in churches that they, they look at it as like, uh, like, like it's a weird teaching. Like if you talk to people in Christian churches, do you have a disciple or you get with somebody, they're like, what? Well, I mean, what do you mean? That means they don't even realize the depth of God's plan that you should be close to people where you feel comfortable about talking about uncomfortable things. And you can't wait for someone to talk to you. You can't go, well, no one came up to you. That's your fault. God's going to hold you accountable to judgment. You need to go, I'm going to give my heart. I'm going to go, if I'm the only stranger in the room and everybody knows each other, I'm going to bring my heart out and go and get to know people and not go, no one really reached out to me. No one made my friend. Well, whoopee do. You're going to end up real hurting in the world. You're going to be lonely in the world and you're going to go to hell because you don't have the courage to love with your heart and give and not wait for people to give. Because that's Jesus' motto. Give. Don't don't wait for people. You give, you give, you give, you give. Jesus gave, Jesus gave to you. Jesus gave to you, so you give. You don't wait. We don't have the world anymore. We don't wait until someone, you know, no one's helping me. Well, go. No one is going to help you because no one knows what you're thinking. Right. Except feeling sorry for yourself. Having, you're having an inner dialogue. Oh, poor me. No one loves me. No one's talking to me. Or my life's different. That's not right. There's no favoritism. You need to take the lot you've been given, the hand God dealt you, and God dealt to you for a reason. And then go, how do I make lemonade out of lemons? Amen. So that's inner dialogue. I'd like to open that up because who can relate to that? And do you read the Bible like that? Do you read the Bible when you're done reading? Go, who am I today in this? Usually there's, there's different stories. That's why Jesus used different people. For me, honestly, I've been Absalom. I've been Saul. I've been Cain. I've been Judas. I've been... Uh, all the worst people in the Bible I've had moments. But you know what? When I was a young Christian, the first reality one time when I really started being honest, a more, more like depth in the Bible, I was trying to be, I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't honest, but I just assumed, you know, when you get out of the gate, you want to be a David, you want to be a Jonathan, you want to be a, a right hand, you want to be like Jesus. But then when you start reading, you'll have a time in your life where you go, you're reading and you're not really relating. If you're honest, you go, good night. I'm thinking like Absalom. Or David, instead of going, I'm with David, you go, I'm not really like David right now. That's when you're really starting to understand what God wants you to see. Because you shouldn't naturally, you, can, you should gravitate to the hero like we do in movies. But in the kingdom of God and in the word, if you're honest because you're a sinner, you're going to be really being able to line up with the wrong, evil, hell-going person at times. And then it's good because you catch yourself and you go, whoa, I need to talk to somebody. I'm not doing well. See what I'm saying? So inner dialogue Jesus knows what you're thinking. He wants you to pray about it. And if you're praying about it, you're going to get open and talk about it with the brother. So you can make sure that you're not being deceived or in a scheme of the devil. So let's open it up for some thoughts on this about God knows your thoughts. But what do you think about how you read the parables or how you read the Bible? There's always usually a villain, the guy that's going to hell or, or a guy that was going to heaven and then went bad. And we got to realize, do we only just, do we just let it go overhead and go, it's a good story? Do we really go, where's my heart? Mm 